Come on, John. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it can really be that simple. But now that we are talking, we must move on to more important things, more important questions like, how have you been? And how's the family? And who are you? Anyway, I don't know you from Adam, Eve, or the serpent. And who let you in here? And just, who do you think I am, anyway? Well, now that we've gotten those out of the way, and obviously, I can't frighten you off with my questions. We must now truly speak. Are you aware that inside all of us is a conundrum? And lovingly folded inside it is an enigma. And enclosed in an envelope inside it is a paradox. And when you dial the right combination, you get a quandary. And when you pry open the quandary, you get Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Because all of this is a ruse to keep your attention away from the second shelf down from there, next to the broken telephone and the bowl of rose leaves, where sits the shoebox. Inside the shoebox you would find reams upon reams of letters you would never write. You do not not write them for reasons of fear that transcend the haunting memory which is the written word or the liability which is flesh made verse. You do not write them for fear that if you write them, he will wish to send them. And if you wish to send them, you will either realize that you have no one to send them to, or perhaps worse, that you do. If you had been at this for long, you would not bother to meet these people who you would not write these letters to. You simply file the pages in no particular order in the shoebox for the moment that will probably never arrive, that moment in which you might need to skim over lines which do not and should not exist. And you take comfort in it. You will simply buy a cat. And another when the first gets lonely. You'll believe it. Still. The gnawing question remains, if the blank after deer were to bear fruit, would it be succulent and sweet or a wax facsimile? In the case of this emergency, if someone were to actually walk up and say, hello, you would know exactly how to act. You would know exactly what to say. You have the moment mapped out in your head down to your last exhalation of breath. Still. When you're standing there on aisle 10, with poison and cart and bag of corn chips in hand, and he or she asks if you're married, you'll say no, but not ask for his or her number. You see, the shoebox's lid is closed, and there are rubber bands holding it so. Oh, so excellent. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> everyone else had left the world, and I was all alone. No one thought to write a note, though I looked. No explanation, nothing written on anyone's calendar. The day was not circled saying, this is it. You were all just gone. The first two weeks, I just sat and waited for an explanation. I tried to make sense of why the power grid didn't fail or why the phones all still worked, though no one answered. And who thought to take all the animals, too? Which is a good thing, because I wouldn't have been able to feed them all. Then for the next week, I fancied that the entire world had secretly been devoutly religious, and I was the only atheist. The rapture had happened. And if I had known Richard Dawkins' number, I would have called to see if he was doing what I was doing. Eating yogurt from the fridge before the expiry date had passed. Then the worst of it was gone, and I spent several months finally reading all the books and watching all the movies I had never had a chance to read or watch before. I went to the drugstore and stole cheap reading glasses and played Burgess Meredith on the steps of the library over and over again, thinking the joke would stop being funny, but it never did. I kept myself busy. For a solid week, I provided chalk outlines for where I thought the people would have fallen, had they fallen. It seemed like a charitable thing to do, a graffiti art project for an audience of one. 
I went and lived in abandoned houses and pretend I belonged there. I tried to go through people's CD libraries and define what they must have been like before they left. It's going to be fine. I stopped incessantly checking my voicemail to see if anyone called. I stopped going online to see if anyone had come on. I am still vlogging, though. <laughs> it sounds mad, but it really does make sense. If it weren't for that, how would I remember all the adventures I've had as the last man on Earth? The last man on Earth. There's not even any vampires here to harass me and be harassed in return. <laughs> even take the pasty-faced monks. I'd accept you, Anthony Zerba. It's okay. Come out and try to kill me. It's all good. Nothing. I'll be moving south before it gets cold. Just in case the grid does go. Just in case. Maybe there's somebody else in some other city thinking these same things. Maybe... Everybody has been shunted into their own world, and everyone wound up alone. It's strange, you know. I'm not feeling lonely, really. I'm just honestly curious as to where you all went. Or if you went anywhere at all. If I could talk to someone and find out what happened, then that would be all right. And that someone would then be free to go. Beautiful. This one's called Paradise. Paradise has lost its novelty. It's like Disneyland at closing time. The patina of glitter has been stripped away, leaving the candy bar wrappers and the stench of human bodies. There could be some semblance of a protest, some shout behind the sigh in your voice, but there's none. The slow transition to ordinary was marked with neither bang nor whisper. Nothing at all. Just the Sunday before you, and a lawn that needs mowing. Kids that want to be driven to dance recital, and other loved ones that ignore and are ignored in turn. I grow old. I grow old. I shall check the nine grain bread for mold. Meticulously, we build these traps for ourselves and then back into them and feign surprise. What we want, what we die to have, perhaps that's just it. We did die to get them and never even noticed. I died to get you, you died to be gotten, and thus the us we had cultivated died on the vine, the new vine, encircling our spines. I can feel it growing up inside me now, ready to burst forth once I am still, ready to carry the spores of my mistakes on the wind. I want them to take root in your skin. I want them to bloom warnings into the spring sunshine, neon candy-petaled warnings of what has come before. No one will heed them, but at least they'll look at me. 